All right. Well, we're here this morning with Eric Sammons. He's been on before. You know him uh, from his book with the catchy title, The Old Evangelization, How to Speak the Faith Like Jesus Did. And uh, we were texting back and forth, Eric, on uh, the division that we're seeing in the Catholic Church. And it's something that's in the hierarchy and it's trickled down into the lady. I, I think especially the last two years, maybe. Um, we've seen this. There's, there was a large middle consensus, and that's all breaking apart. So uh, Eric and I are going to spend some time this morning talking about that. Before we do, we'll begin with our prayer. I'll put it on the screen. All right, we'll pray the Our Father, the Pater Noster. Nomine Patris, et Fidii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, quies in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniant regnum tuum, Fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum de nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Fidii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. And St. Thomas Aquinas, pray, pray for, for us. us. St. Pio, pray for pray us. For St. Pius X, pray, pray for, for us. us. All right. Well, Eric, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Good. Thank you. Good. How's life at the Salmon's home? Oh, it's good. Yeah, we're just uh, continuing on. I got my kids keep every two years are leaving the house. Uh, so uh, getting used to that, you know, as the as the numbers dwindle who are staying at home and the rest going off to college or even graduating from college. But it's all good. Yeah. What's that like? I, you know, I, I got eight kids and they're all here. Is it a relief? <laughs> <laughs> Is it sad? Is it it's, it's both. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's bittersweet. It's, it's great because you love seeing your kids turn out great. I mean, I'm, I, I'll brag. I'll be a bragging father. I don't mind. Mm -hmm. Because you know how it is. When you first get parents, you have no idea if what you're doing is going to work. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. you're trying to, to raise your kids Catholic. You're trying to do all this stuff. You just don't know what's going to happen. And so when you see them graduate and go off on their own, and, and, you know, still live the faith and be wonderful people. It's a great thing. But at the same time, it is sad. I mean, I love having my kids around. I love, you know, uh, my oldest who's graduated, she's all the way, she's actually near part of the world in Dallas. So that's very far away from me. So I love having them around. So that is sad. But I love seeing them thrive in, in the world as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Did your grocery bill go down? It does. But we have my, my, oldest at home right now is a 16 year old six foot two boy and he works out a ton yeah and so he eats all the time right. so he's okay. making so, up yeah. for the girls who have left so, so it averages out it averages out exactly <laughs> all right so let's talk about this growing division you know there was this consensus where you could go to a catholic dinner party and you'd see authors from, you know, different, you'd go to a conference, you know, circles we were, have been in for the past 10 plus years and everybody got along, mm -hmm. you know, you could mingle in a room and yeah, I mean, there was different emphases and there's charismatics and there's a few trads and, you know, but maybe someone, you know, was a little bit more on in a social justice or teaching or whatever, but it, what, there was no, no clause out. And it seems right. now that is no longer the case. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've written books for Our Sunday Visitor, mm -hmm. which is a very standard uh, kind of mainline uh, Catholic publishing house. Also for Catholic Answers, which is more, which is still mainline, but a little more hardcore than you would call Our Sunday Visitor. And when I would go to conferences, uh, speaking engagements, what have you, you're right. It was, I mean, we knew there was division kind of, there was division in the church, you know, for the past 50 years, 60 years. But it was mostly between the progressives and this loose federation of traditionalists and conservatives. Yeah, a loose federation. I like that. Sure, we we had our differences. And I'll be the first to say for the longest time, I was in the conservative Catholic camp. I mean, from the time I converted in the early 90s until relatively recently, I was in that conservative camp. So, yeah, I thought the traditionalists were a little bit out there, but I still considered them brothers in arms. They weren't it, it, more so than the progressive Catholics who were trying to undermine Catholic teaching at every turn. And so, yes, when I would go and I'd, you'd meet with these people, it, 
we all felt like we were on the same team. Yeah, sometimes we'd had disagreements about this or that, but we were, we were on Pope John Paul II's team. We were on Pope Benedict's team. Yeah. And we were together trying to right the ship. And once it got in the right direction, then we would argue somewhat about the details of what that meant. Right. But I just, that, that isn't happening. I mean, there are people I considered friends who really have, uh, we've gone different directions and it, it's been sad to see and to the point of, they consider me not really, uh, a faithful Catholic anymore. And yeah, I just think here. that's, that's sad. And, and, and I don't, I know I've changed some, but I don't feel like I've really changed that much in the sense of I've just gotten to, to understand the church, just church's teachings more, uh, become more knowledgeable about its history, its tradition. And yet somehow that has made me, uh, outside the fold, no longer even willing to give me the benefit of the doubt that I'm, that I'm a, a faithful Catholic. And, and that's just sad to see. Mm-hmm. And I, I still consider them, most of them, I mean, yes, even when they do crazy things and say some crazy stuff and defend some crazy stuff, I still consider them as they're trying to be orthodox, but or at least most of them, but they just have a misunderstanding of what it means to be an orthodox Catholic, that right. it's not a matter of just following whatever the latest words out of the Vatican are, that it yeah. that encompasses something uh, more complex and, and deeper than that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking back to a time where, you know, you could be at a conference and in the same conference you would have, maybe this never actually happened, but it's it could have happened maybe in like 2001, you know. You right. could have like Mark Shea and Peter Craved and Scott Hahn and Eric Sammons and I mean who else could be in there? Austin yeah, I mean, Roos. Right, right, exactly. Uh, all uh, all these, you know, you could have first things people, uh all of us, me, you know, and everything would be kind of, you know, there'd be maybe some disagreements, but it'd all be a friendly fair. Now it, there's so many people slinging mud. Right. And and yeah, it's it's like it's just thrown into name calling where you're a schismatic now, you're a heretic, or they use the left's uh, name calling of you're an anti semite, you're a racist, mm. and it will be over things that have nothing to do with anti semitism or racism or anything like that, or sk- or acts of schism. I mean, that's the most recent one is this throwing around the word schismatic at people yeah. who are trying to defend Catholic teaching. Right. I mean, you literally that's the opposite of the definition <laughs> of schism. Yeah. And so, but you're right. Back in the you know. 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, I mean, I remember, I don't want to, you know, pick on one person in particular, but I do remember 15 years ago, I had a very good relationship with Mark Shea. I invited him to my parish to speak. I remember going out to pizza with him afterwards. We had a great time and we were on the same page. And when I look at what I thought then, what I think now, yes, my own understanding has uh, developed since then. But I don't think I've changed that much. And it's just amazing how, though, he now looks at somebody like me mm-hmm. as being just I'm I'm the I'm the crazy one. And I'm, I'm just What's the I'm going to be uses Christianist. Is that what he says? Yeah, cr- Christianist. But it always whatever it is, it's got to be capitalized and uh, a TM after it. I'm a yeah. TM or a Christianist. And. And it's just it's basically just name calling instead of saying, well, let's look at this in a mature way and let's talk about it and figure out, okay, I see, Mark, that you're and whoever that you're looking at things differently, that you believe that I am off the track in my criticisms of of Pope Francis or the Amazon Center or something like that. Let's let's talk about that. Let's figure out Mm -hmm. like we would have 15 years ago when we disagreed about something we would have talked about. Why can't we talk about it now? What has changed that's made yeah. me outside the pale? Yep. There's no more. I, talk, I don't, there's I don't, no more. They're all t- about talking about dia- dialogue and debate. And then when we say, okay, well, let's do it. Nothing. Right. They delete our messages. They call yeah. us a schismatic. You're not worthy of a platform. These are and the kind of, of course, things that we hear. And that's exactly, you know, that happened to me on Twitter last week when Dawn Eden Goldstein, she, she had been saying some pretty outlandish things about mm-hmm. some friends of mine. 
And, and I said to her, listen, let's have a public debate about this. Twitter's not the place that we can have a, a serious discussion of things. And I offer, because we're both Catholic Answers authors, I said, why don't we have Catholic Answers uh, moderate it? Or anybody. I didn't care who moderated it, to be honest. Because yeah. I just thought it would be helpful for Catholics if we had a discussion. I thought a topic such as uh, the role of the papacy in the life of a Catholic would be a good one. Like, how, What is our duty mm -hmm. towards the Pope? And how should we look at his pronouncements on an airplane or in a, even in a, a document that he writes? And so she responded by basically saying, well, since you reject Vatican II as invalid, uh, until you stop doing that, I, I'm not going to talk to you. I said, well, I don't. I mean, I didn't know what she was talking about. I was like, <laughs> I don't think Vatican II is invalid. I, I think it's a totally valid ecumenical council of the church. And so she said, well, you criticized it a couple weeks ago, and so that means you think it's invalid. I'm like, what? What does that mean? And I said, Pope Benedict criticized Vatican II. Does that mean he thinks it's invalid? She's like, well, no, Pope Benedict criticized it in a different way than you are. So it's okay right. for him, but not for you. And I just realized, and, you know, and yeah. she never yeah, yeah. Uh, wanted to give a debate. And she just said, no, no, I don't think that'd be helpful. Okay, fine. I I'm not like saying people are required to say yes to every request for a debate. But right. don't try to hide it behind this. You're, I'm not going to give you a platform because you're so extreme. Right. That's the language now that's used mm -hmm. is instead of what, you know, Pope Francis himself has made it very clear a couple things, at least in his statements, that we should dialogue with people we don't, dis we don't agree with. And, and he welcomes criticism. He has said those two things over and over again. So if we take him at his word, then we shouldn't just treat anybody who disagrees with us as outside the pale, not deserving of a platform or whatever. In fact, that's the whole purpose of a debate. We don't agree. That's why we want to debate. If we agreed, there's no purpose to it. Right. And so I, I think this whole direction that many Catholics who are primarily the, the strongest defenders of Pope Francis – this direction of going towards uh, demonizing other Catholics is too extreme to even talk to is just crazy. And I've seen, it, frankly, I've seen how they've been doing it to you as well, Taylor, because, I mean, you, you, you know, you've been around for a while. You've been writing books for a while. You've been, you know, doing your uh, the Thomas Aquinas Institute, all that for a while, giving all this great information to Catholics. You know, all of a sudden, overnight... Now you're an extremist? Now you, you're not even worthy of, of a discussion with? Yes, I I, I'll be the first to admit that you're, you're, some of your thesis that you, that you put out there are striking, and they can make a Catholic who isn't really paying attention think, whoa, what? That, that's crazy. What are you talking about, infiltration in the church? That's just crazy. Are, are you some uh, weird conspiracy theorist? But if you're, if you're open-minded, like in the way that you should be, then you should say, well, okay, this guy has produced a lot of good contact, he's content in the past. He's clearly been on, on, on key for a long time. If he puts out a book like Infiltration or starts talking about things like that, maybe I should at least say give him the benefit of the doubt and give him an opportunity to, to make his point. And if I don't agree with him after that, fine. But don't just dismiss your thesis as just outside the pale just because – we don't like what it is. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. We don't like the reality if you're right. And if I'm right about the fact that Pope Francis has really been leading the church in, in the wrong direction and fostering a lot of confusion, I don't like the conclu that conclusion. <laughs> I don't want I don't to like it either. <laughs> but we can't bury our heads in the sand and just say, well, I don't like it, so I'm not going to listen to it. I'm, I'm going I'm to, and I'm going to demonize the people who say those things because I don't like what that world would be like. Right. Because let's be honest, we lived in a a world under Pope John Paul II and Benedict, and I say we, I mean people like us, you know, conservative mm -hmm. Catholic types, where we were like, well, it's just a matter of time before we win. The, everything in the church is going our direction. All the young priests are right. are being ordained now, are great, and all the old bishops are the bad ones, and they're mm -hmm. going to all retire and. Yeah, it's just going to be a couple weeks, basically, till everything is hunky dory again. Well, then, with the election of Pope Francis and the people he's elevated, the people like McCarrick that he put in positions of trust and authority, 
it's hard to keep that thesis alive. I still hold, hold out hope this is the last desperate gasp of the liberal Catholicism of the 60s and 70s, but I don't like plan on that. Yeah. But I just don't like, you know, I understand people not liking that, but I don't understand how you can bury your head in the sand when you see the numbers and the reality of a church crumbling right in front of our eyes. The numbers don't lie. People are leaving the Catholic Church in droves. I mean, just unbelievable numbers. We prop it up in this country by immigration. A lot of that is the reason our numbers aren't as bad as they should be. But if you look at number of new baptisms, new receptions into the church, it's just, it's cratered. And that's the sign of vitality in two ways. First of all, in conversions, but also in births. Because the other way, of course, we're creating is we don't have kids anymore. Uh, So many Catholics are contracepting and And so we're just not replenishing the supply, so to speak. And so I just don't understand how you can look at that. And that really was the the, the light bulb for me, the red pill moment, whatever you want to call it for me, was when I worked as a director of evangelization for diocese for five years, I was knee deep in this stuff. I was knee deep in in the numbers and trying to figure out ways that we can make things better. And I just came to the conclusion that the reality is nothing we're doing is working. And so why would you continue doing it? And but somehow that has now put me outside the mainstream because I won't anymore say that program X and program Y are the way to go and the way we're going to revitalize our parish and right. revitalize. We've done A through Z programs in the parish level at the diocesan level. And I'm talking about even the, the good ones. I'm not I, that they're good intentions. They're trying to do the right thing, but. It's just not it's not helping. And so I don't see why we would continue just beating down that that door. Yeah. I think what happened, you know, just I reflect on this a lot because I'm constantly shocked by the people that throw me under the bus who I thought we used to be friends. Um, I think part of it is in America, we had a change in discourse in the public arena. And that happened under President Barack Obama, Mm -hmm. where we had the identity politics and it was. You're no, certain people are no longer worthy to be talked with. Right. They always talk about dialogue, but then there's a certain subset that are the untouchables. A somehow huge subset that, now. Yeah, somehow that was adopted by certain Catholics that we we don't talk with these people. I think I think you're right about it happening under Obama. I'm not even saying it's necessarily him driving it, although I think he was a major well, yeah, I'm not, I'm part not of he's it. Had this Catholic scheme right, right. to get us, but, but I, I think, think that that was adopted by people. I think you're right because if you remember, I, I remember seeing this history very well. Remember when he accepted, uh, publicly said gay marriage was okay, and it was Biden who kind of slipped first, the Catholic mm-hmm. Biden, Catholic Biden, who slipped first with it, and then Obama came out and said, literally a week before he said that, you could be against gay marriage and nobody would, everybody be like, okay, fine. A week after Obama said that, you were now the equivalent of a Nazi if you thought gay marriage was wrong. And I thought, I felt like when I saw that, I was like, whoa. And the same thing has happened with the transgender movement that Mm -hmm. it seems like five minutes ago, if you thought that a boy shouldn't pretend to be a girl or think he's a girl, then that was fine. That was like, of course, that was like common sense. But now all of a sudden, you're Hitler, you're Stalin. And it really has, and of course, it's amped up even more with the election of Trump, who is literally Hitler. <laughs> right. That's what we've been told over and over. And of course, people don't remember that they said the same thing about McCain and Romney, who were about as vanilla Republican as you can right. get. They were terrible. But the language has changed, and I do think, and you're right, it's seeped into the Catholic discussion that you have, if you are not a 100% cheerleader for Francis, you're just not worthy of, of talking to anymore. That the underlying assumption has to be that you you defend every single thing he says, you're not a good Catholic. Yeah. And I do think there are some theological, for some people there are theological, not cultural reasons for that. They, they honestly believe that a Catholic is supposed to defend and support every single word that comes out of Pope's mouth. And let's be honest, we saw that under JP two and under Benedict, mm-hmm. we might've been guilty of it ourselves at times. Yep. And so 
Yeah, I mean, let's do our mea culpas. I mean, yeah. it, we can't uh, we can't act like that didn't happen exactly. And so now we're seeing though, whenever whenever people in the church do things that are not the way they should be done, if when they sin, stuff, there's always consequences. And I feel like that's one of the consequences of our say our arguments. I remember back in the day were were against women priests because look, Pope John Paul just said it's a teaching right. of the church. Well, Pope John Paul is simply affirming the perennial teaching of the church. And so the reason we're against women priests isn't because JP2 said it was wrong. It was because Jesus Christ himself instituted it like this. And the tradition has always been like this. And and JP2 affirmed it. Mm -hmm. And so, but when your argument starts with, when it leads with JP2. And I always say, we got sloppy. We got weak. You know, you, it's it's very easy to say, well, this was this statement was issued in such and such a year. Drop the mic and story, right? That's a lot of us were doing that right. in our books, in our talks. We were doing that. Yep. And historically, you know, there was an appeal. The Pope was the infallible guarantor of the deposit of faith. And you're... You're not just appealing to papal documents. You're constantly appealing to scripture and tradition. Even Bennett the Sixteenth said that the authors of sacred scripture are the normative theologians for us. Right, right. And you know, he is the Pope is the steward, not the king. Exactly. And the steward isn't supposed to remake his, the kingdom in his image. Mm-hmm. He is supposed to simply keep it in the king's image. That's right. And so, but if we start treating the steward as the king, or if the steward starts thinking he's the king, mm-hmm. which I believe is somewhat what's happening now, then we really run into all kinds of problems. Right. And another analogy, a uh, more modern sports analogy would be the Pope is the captain of defense <laughs> in the sense that he is defending. His job is primarily, it's not that he can't go on offense at times, but right. his primary job is the captain of the defense, right. that he is making sure that the teachings of the church are held and, and maintained and protected. That's his primary duty before yeah. all else, not to come up. And so the idea of, of even, even the idea of going out and, and, and a Catholic having to know what the, the most recent Pope has said on the most recent thing now, that's even goes against how Catholics have always lived. You know, think about the English peasant living in the 12th century and he's living the, the, the daily life of the church, you know, he's going to mass regularly. His, his holidays are holy days. That's the only time he gets off yeah. from the drudgery of life. And he's, but he's living faithfully. He's living the sacraments, raising his kids like his dad raised him, his father's father raised him and all the way back and do it always the same. He probably doesn't even know who the Pope is other than maybe his name. And that's about it. And he prays for him and he might pray for the Holy Father. Somebody. But that's it. Let me tell you what, that guy can be a saint. Yep. And there's nothing keeping him from that. So even this modern idea that we're supposed to follow every word, and let's be honest, I would probably say JP2 is the one who magnified that. Not from bad attention intentions. I think JP2 wanted to be an evangelizer who went out to the world and brought Christ to the world. I think that was his intention, and it was a very good one. And in many ways, he did that. Many people and priests have you know, converted, become priests because of him. But I do think what that did was it created the celebrity rock star pope that we're now supposed to treat as a political. We're a party. We're in parties now. Yes. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're Francis is, is our leader of our party. And so we defend everything he does, just like a political party would, like a Republican right. would defend every single thing Trump does or a Democrat with Obama or whatever. That's not Catholicism. Mm-hmm. And and so the pope could literally reign for 15 years and we never hear uh, much from him at all and he could be a great pope in fact that's he'd right. probably be a lot better than lately <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah yeah i mean even if you go back to pope Pius the 12th which is not that long ago and you read his schedule i have a schedule printed i won't oh, really? if you have you read his schedule for the day no i haven't it's it's quite remarkable it's quite remarkable um let me see if i can just flip open to it if i can we'll talk about it and no this is going to take a little while to find but um it's it's pretty mundane it's pretty boring you know oh here it is here it is i just flipped through it here it is okay 
So this is Pope Pius XII's daily uh, schedule. So he gets up at 6.30 a.m. He, he, he has a prayer and he does some exercise. At 7.10, he says Mass and does a Thanksgiving after Mass. 8.30, breakfast and coffee of dry bread. 8.50, enters his study. 9 to 3 p.m., audiences with cardinals and high Vatican officials, diplomats, state officials, and other persons with the public. So that's most of his day from 9 a.m. Right. to 3 p.m. He's just having meetings with people behind doors. At 3 p.m., he has lunch of soup, meat, and vegetables, and sometimes fruit and cheese. The Franciscan brothers prepare his meals. At 4 p.m., he walks in the Vatican Garden and reads. 5 p.m., goes to the chapel and says the rosary and the breviary. 6 p.m., goes to study and works. 8 p.m., supper of eggs, fruit, goes to chapel and prays. 9 p.m., works in his study, on to sometimes 1.30 a.m. Finishes, breviary, night prayers, sleep, goes to sleep. Where were his air, airplane interviews? I missed yeah, that I one. Know. It's just sort of like, it's like kind of what your grandpa would do if he was had to have a bunch of meetings. Right. These are, right. These, are these are grandfatherly guys, you know, and right. they don't have this hustle schedule. They're, you know, they wake up, say mass, have some bread, some fruit, <laughs> meetings, right. eat, and I th go to bed, I pray the rosary. And I think one thing the church really is going to have to do over the next century or so is really deter, really make clear in the light of Vatican I and Vatican II what the role of the Pope is for in the life of the average daily Catholic. Right. That I feel, I know that when I say things like this, there will be, somebody called me a quasi city vacanist on Twitter mm -hmm. because I was suggesting that we don't have to agree with and, and support every single thing the Pope does. Right. And that's, and that's, again, a way to demonize somebody, make them outside the extreme. Yeah. I mean, all I said was that in my, when I converted to Catholicism, my dad said that he thought I was joining a cult. And he didn't say it in some, you know, he wasn't attacking me. He just was, you know, there's more sadness. Mm. And the reason he said it was because the idea that Catholics blindly are accept and obey every single word that the Pope ever says. And if that were true, we would be a cult. And I just made the comment that if you look at certain defenders of of Pope Francis, then I think my dad would be vindicated. <laughs> and okay. for that, I was a quasi steady vacanist. And by using those terms, I, I'm now outside the, the the boundaries. Going back to our original topic, the, the our the boundaries of of uh, polite discussion that I'm not even worthy to be debated with or engaged with. Right. Whereas just a few years ago, I was, now all of a sudden I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's not how you really resolve these things. Like if, I was, if I were they, if I was somebody who was, I don't know why I wouldn't want to debate with somebody like you. Because to me, I'd be like, well, I, I've, I understand the Catholic faith right. I will show mm -hmm. Taylor and to all his fans that, yeah. that, that he's, why he's wrong. And we could move forward then. It would, it would, it, maybe if it didn't convince Taylor, it would convince some of the people who agree with him, and it, we'd be better off. I, because that's my philosophy hey, in wanting to debate somebody. Eric, I'd love, if I could stop having to think about a Morris, you know, and <laughs> think about the Amazon Synod, and right. thinking about McCarrick, and all the things going on in Vatican City, uh, my life would be great. I'd love if someone could come, come along and convince me right. everything in the Catholic Church in 2019 is awesome. Right. It is so awesome. Taylor, you need to relax. Right. Because everything right now is going as the Holy Spirit desires. The, right. the positive will of the Holy Trinity is on point and on track right now. That'd be great. Any, yeah, but anyone looking around knows that it's not. And so hey. to, to, to raise up the flag and, and just say, you know, alert, there's a problem right now. Father Mike Schmitz had a good analogy the other day. Uh, he said, you know, this is, this is how the body heals itself, right? You, right? It has to it has to have some discourse. It has to have some talking. I mean, even at the first ecumenical council, Nicaea, they let Arius take the floor. Right. He was wrong. 
He did not Jesus was, Christ, uh... <laughs> but they gave him his time. Yeah, Nicholas came along and had some <laughs> had some physical interaction there. Right. Uh, but, you know, that's interesting. Right. And then in today, you bring up these topics and it's like, um, no, we're, we're not going to engage you. Um, you know, I invited on this on this whole Dare We Hope thing with Balthazar right. and all that with Bishop Barron. I said, hey, let's have a friendly debate. A discussion no one's going to get mad no one's going to call names let's talk about scripture by scripture father by father go through the balthazarian thesis let's do it you know i put an invite out to bishop Barron, and he deleted it you know i said hey let's let's have a friendly discussion it can be word on fire it can be, it can be third party it could be random on skype um but delete it right or at least just say no and you know, here's and the then, thing, they're, they're treat, it's treating you like there are some, there are nut jobs, of course, out there that just have crazy ideas about whatever. And I understand you're not going to give them a platform because it's not worth it. But here's the reality. Tens of thousands of people view your videos, which tells me that if I think you're, you're extreme, you're crazy, it tells me that your beliefs are infecting way too many Catholics. If I'm if I'm of somebody of the other thinking. And so the first thing I would think, if I'm a bishop especially, I need to lead those wayward sheep back. Yeah. Because clearly this is something lots of Catholics are thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like I'm yeah, sure I mean, if Barron thinks Balthazar is the gospel, that's the truth. That's what is in the New Testament. And I'm saying it's not, he has the episcopal duty to say. Marshall's wrong. Balthazar's right. Everybody get back on the Balthazar train. Right. And, and if and, I'm right and right. Balthazar is not the gospel, then people need to get off that train. This is a serious thing. It's not just like, do you think, you know, the liturgical color for Advent should be blue or purple? <laughs> right, right. This, oh, it, it, it this is this everything. is this is about soteriology. This is about how we present the gospel. This is how about how people live their lives. This is a big deal. I personally think indifferentism, which is basically what this is, the idea that it doesn't really matter uh, what your religion is. I think that is a scourge that has way more impact on the daily life of your average parish than anybody wants to believe. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't think it really matters to be Catholic, then that's going to impact your liturgy. It's going to impact your catechesis. It's going to impact your your social outreach. It's going to impact your relations with other, you know, non-Catholic churches and denominations. It's going to impact your your evangelization efforts. It literally will impact every aspect of the life of a parish, which means it impacts the average parish-going Catholic. So if I am Bishop Barron, whose uh, specialty is evangelization, I mean, he's he was. I don't know if he still is. I know he's head of the evangelization. He was a chair of evangelization committee for USCCB for a while. He might still be. And that course has been his, his, his main outreach, has been reaching out to people. Well, if I'm evangelizing, I'm looking at groups of people who have, fallen, who have fallen away from the faith and find out why and address it directly. Well, if he thinks somebody like you has basically fallen away from the, the true faith, which is kind of what he's saying, and, and you have this huge following, at least by Catholic standards, then... I would, if I'm the bishop, I'm like, I need to address that. I need to not just wave it away and say, oh, it's some extreme thought, because all that does is get people more, uh, more. It, it draws the battle lines more clearly, and it makes people not willing to even discuss. So it makes people who think that you have a good point, they really start to turn against Bishop Barron. And we don't want people, we don't want people turning against the bishop of the Catholic Church, especially one like Bishop Barron, who does good work and has a lot of things he's done outreach. good for the church. Yeah. yeah, good outreach, a, a stuff like that. Huge platform, yeah. Yeah, huge platform. Uh, he, I know he's brought many people to a deeper understanding of Catholicism and, the, and, and Christ, and I think that's great. And so we don't want people treating him at, we don't want him people treating him, frankly, as he's treating you, I think is the best way to put it. But if he does treat people like us as extremists, then that's exactly what happens. All it does is just make this division wider the gulf bigger and make it more difficult for us to bridge it. You know, let's use uh, uh, Father James Martin <laughs> building the bridges. 
Well, if you want to build these bridges, then the way we do that is we have true, honest debates without pulling punches and civil, of course. I mean, that, that goes without saying. But we're willing to say things like, you know, von Balthasar's teaching has had dire consequences to the, the salvation of souls. And if we can't say that, mm -hmm. if we're just like, no, that's an extreme statement even to think. Right. Or you know, go check out my FAQ. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it would be, and I, that's why I think it's sad, these divisions. And they are, I do, th and honestly, okay, now we're going to get to the, the, the hard part is, I do think a lot of them can be laid at the feet of Pope Francis. And if you look at how he treated, for example, the Dubia Cardinals, this, that, is where I, this is where I wanted to go. It's right. It, it's if if you look how the Pope treats the dubia, and you you see the Pope saying, "Well, these people are schismatics." Well, then of course you're going to have someone like you know Don Eden Goldstein right. saying, "Well, Eric Salmon's a schismatic." I mean, she's where right. is she getting this? She's getting it right. from Dad. It's like the old '80s drug commercial. I learned it from watching <laughs> you, Dad. That's where this is coming from. It's top down. Right. It's trickle down discourse. And because the truth is, I don't know if I've ever seen a more passive aggressive pope <laughs> in history uh, because he will say things like we need to dialogue. Mm. We need to uh, engage the peripheries. Mm -hmm. But then when there is a true what he would consider, what I assume a periphery, people like us, traditional Catholics who are begging to be uh, heard in the church and 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 and. and willing to criticize dad, but in love and because we want what's best for dad and for his children, when you're, when you're basically ignored on one hand, in the sense you don't answer the dubia cardinals, but then on the other hand, you make all these statements that are clearly directed at a, a Cardinal Burke or the other dubia cardinals, calling them rigid, calling them, you know, basically making it and suggesting they're in schism. I mean, when that reporter asked him, and I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the question was planted, when that reporter asked him about you know, schism in the American church, the correct answer would have been to just dismiss the question and say it's stupid to even say the word schism in relation to criticisms from people in the American church, the, the well-funded. By the way, when those funds come, let me know. Um, but, and so... It's a passive aggressive thing. You, you don't answer, but then you backhandedly attack and and demonize and make as extreme people like that. So you're right. When people like uh, Don and even Bishop Barron, when they do that to people like us, they're following the lead mm -hmm. of Pope Francis. And, and, and they're and excited about said, that. They're, they're, right. They would be eager, I think, to remind us. You know, I mean, yes. Barron just came out and, you know, he said uh, to someone who said, hey, did you see Vigano mention Marshall's book to Barron? Like, you can't just write it off. That's kind right. of a big deal, especially when Barron said Vigano is trustworthy. Um, and then Bishop Barron said, come on, friend, did you read his book? Quote, I have zero interest in giving him any sort of platform, end quote. And that's the line that leftists, and I don't consider Bishop Barron a leftist, but that's the line leftists have used for years now, the giving a platform. And right. so Pro Pope Francis defenders have adopted that language, that political language. And think about that for a second. That, that flies directly against the, the teachings of our Lord and the church to always reach out to those in need, to those who are, are, are outside the norm that you think it is. I also think it shows a certain uh, amount of... of a lack of self-confidence in what you believe because he's only giving you a platform if you win the debate. <laughs> if he crushes you because yeah. you your arguments are stupid and, and have nowhere to go and he's he knows he's confident his beliefs are true, then that there's no chance. The same thing when I was talking to Don, it's like if you really think that I'm so so terrible, you're not giving me a platform, you're destroying my platform. Exactly. And so let me, you know, let's have a public I mean, debate. If if Arius the heretic, the heresy arc were around right now, I'd be like, yeah, let's let's debate, right. let's talk. I've got my right. scripture, I got my I got my Bible ready to go. Let's do it. 
because I'm confident that Arius's error is manifest. It's wrong. And that right. people would see it as they did when St. Athanasius exposed him. Right. The and truth Saint is Nicholas, beautiful. Maybe in others. Yeah, the truth is beautiful and people of goodwill will be attracted to it. And so there's no harm in giving error and heresy a platform, not obviously in an official sense, in, but in the sense of allowing them to basically bury their own grave. Right. Because when they when they talk heresy, if an Arius talks heresy, then you can then defeat it by the truth through scripture and tradition. And so it really makes you wonder how much confidence these people have when they keep saying we won't give them a platform because now it's become a political party. Like I said, party Catholicism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's no longer a seeking of, together of the truth, but instead it's a we have to demonize and minimalize our opponents so that we can crush them. Yeah. And I think that has been the MO of Pope Francis during his pontificate is that he will do that. He will demonize his opponents and by as rigid as schismatic or what have you. And a lot, sometimes he'll do it through his, his uh, most ardent defenders, the people who he knows the bishops who, and, and journalists and people like that, who he knows will carry his water. And, it's just a way that he doesn't have to deal with them then and, and, and continue. But that's a political ploy. That's not a religious or theological ploy. Yeah. And so it all it does is create more division. And the truth is, I think what it does sometimes, it actually creates actual extremists. You mm -hmm. see this in how you labeling people anti-Semitic so quickly that believe the traditional teaching of the church that all people – need to come to salvation in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That That's includes right. Muslims, that includes atheists, and that does include Jews. Now, as soon as you add that last part, there will be some who will say you're an anti-Semitic. Yes, every time. And the problem, though, with that, I mean, there's lots of problems to, with it, but one of the, I think, sociological kind of issues happens is there will be people who say, well, I'm being called an anti-Semitic anyway, so I might as well just be, you know, act, be anti-Semitic. And, and they kind of go, and I've seen people who go kind of to the extreme, not, not mainstream people, of course, uh, not me with any audience. I mean, I personally think the whole like rise of anti-Semitism and, and racism is, is nothing. The Ku Klux Klan has like 15 members in America. Uh, but I do think what it does though, it, it just hardens people's hearts mm -hmm. when you do that. And so, we should be willing to say, let's have a debate about what anti-Semitism truly is. Is it the conviction that all people, including Jews, need Jesus Christ and need to convert to Catholicism for salvation? Or is it the idea that somehow Jews are lesser people or uh, hated by God in some special way or anything like that? And, and that's, all, that's true anti-Semitism. Uh, and, and and by calling things like just the traditional teaching of church anti-Semitism, the, the 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 name the 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 label loses all power. Yeah. And same thing with racism. Same thing with just the idea of tradition. I mean, traditionalist is a curse word now, and considered a traditional Catholic. Yeah. Is is now it's not to yeah it, it's like automatically. Yeah. And it, it and I just think that that becomes. When is it that the word, I mean, literally, when you think of Catholicism, one of the first words you should think of to describe it is traditional, is tradition, yeah. the word traditional tradition. religion. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like the idea that somebody calling themselves a traditional Catholic automatically means that they're an extremist Catholic and therefore not worthy of a platform. Mm -hmm. It just shows a certain unwillingness to engage uh, with people that Pope Francis, at least in word, says we're supposed to do. We're supposed to dialogue with such people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm concerned because I think unless something changes, it'll only get worse. Uh, they'll be able to to use the idea that if you don't agree with what the Pope said on an airplane, you are a schismatic, you're a set of a contest, right? You're an anti-Semite. Yeah. I mean, you're a racist. All of these things have come out in the last year. I mean, I even saw an article just after the whole schism thing came up where it basically said 
you are in schism and the church should excommunicate you formally. That he, it, it, basically, he, this person was arguing that by, by defending uh, the idea that, or not, not, I should say, by not supporting every word that comes from the Pope mm-hmm. or even questioning it ever, you've put yourself in schism, the church should formally excommunicate you. And the truth is, a, the church can't excommunicate somebody like us who do nothing wrong. I mean, it excommunicated Joan of Arc. Right. And, and those things are real. I mean, it, it, can, it, would be a, 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 it would be a valid excommunication in one sense, in that they have the authority to do it. But, of course, in the eyes of God, it would be an unjust act, and the person's soul would not be in, in the danger of hell that it might be in if it was a, legit, a truly legitimate excommunication. But in that case, what's a Catholic to do? I mean, they're not just talking about you. like Because, as you know, there has been zero talk of schism from any of us. I mean, we, on our side, the whole point we're making is we don't want people leaving the church. We want to be faithful yeah. to the Catholic Church. I mean, there's no schism anywhere on the horizon. The only schism on the horizon is maybe coming from Germany, from the other side. Right. And so, but that I think what they're doing is they're pushing it to say it's schism is step calling them kind of schismatic is step one. Well, by doing that and by saying they don't deserve a platform that they're extreme that they're anti-Semitic, racist. Well, then excommunication is on the table. Because if somebody is truly an anti-Semite and they are uh, preaching something uh, like the Jewish people are an inferior race or whatever have you, that person probably is deserving of excommunication. I mean, obviously, you had to go through the whole process, but those things are worthy. And so if we become those people, then excommunication is on the table, which I think might be an end goal for some of them. They want that to happen because mm-hmm. then we're, the, the problem is they can just look at us and say, well, look, they're not even Catholic. They're not even in the church. Right. We don't have to deal with them. So they're doing it through like social media and other ways now. But then the end goal is to do it in, in reality. It, it, the thing that bothers me is, you know, you see on Facebook, on Google, YouTube, Twitter, the deplatforming of certain voices. Absolutely. And they're, again, they're kind of taking the, this started under Barack Obama. And they're taking these cues. And they're always the first one to say, well, in the Catholic Church, there is no left and right. right. <laughs> Those are political terms. But it seems that in the same circles, they're the ones who are like, deplatform him. He's not worthy right. of a platform. Don't talk to him. No debate. No discussion. They're schismatics. They're racist. They're anti-Semites. Right. And they're, they're using the political discourse and the political methods to silence. And, you know... We always talk about Saul Alinsky in America, but very few have actually read him. And I, I've been studying him and reading him a little bit. And he has his rules for radicals. Right. The 13th rule of Saul Alinsky, I think, applies to this situation. Here's what's now for those that don't know, Saul Alinsky was a communist infiltrator. He worked out of Chicago. He worked with the Catholic Church. He worked with Protestants. He worked with everybody. Uh, he realized that communist revolutions weren't going to happen with blood in the street but through a very uh, careful persuasion of people, especially through powerful people like cardinals, bishops, pastors, politicians, mayors. So Solinsky has these rules for radicals, and the 13th rule is pick a target. This is, quote, pick a target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Notice he doesn't say engage it, debate, discuss. The, the left never does this. You know, if you ever get into a, a true discussion over, say, abortion, they are never going to have a discussion about science with you. Right. What are they going to do? Pick a target, freeze it, personalize it, polarize it. Right. And that's in a way. And that's exactly what, they, right. what they've done, done to you and to me and to others is right. they pick us, freeze us, personalize it, polarize it dismissed, gone, we're not going to engage with you. You don't deserve a platform. It's right. coming I mean, from he, people like Bishop Barron, the right. USCCB, and Pope Francis. Yeah, yeah and, and the, the Bishop Barron and you is a, is a great example because here we have a situation in which by anybody who has even the slightest knowledge of history knows that your position on the salvation of souls and dare we hope and all that is... The traditional one <laughs> is the one that's been hell for a long time. Yeah. We'll just say that. 
right. and Bishop Barron's is the new one. Now, right. Bishop Barron can argue it's a legitimate development, and I'm not saying he can't argue that, but the fact that you're simply arguing what has been held for 2,000 years, and that has been personalized and you know, ter- demonized and turned into an extreme position, that's what's crazy. Because, yeah. yes, Bishop Barron, make your argument that this is a legitimate development, because there are legitimate developments in our understanding of the Catholic faith. I'm a big believer in that. I think uh, you know, John Henry Newman, soon to be St. John Henry Newman, was right in that understanding, that our understanding of the teaching church do deepen over time. It's just human nature. We can't understand everything overnight. But of course, what's happened is that idea of development has been just completely turned into evolution, into a change of uh, change in kind. I mean, you saw that, you see that, of course, most clearly with the death penalty situation. You know, the idea that death yes. penalty was wrong yesterday and is right to I'm sorry, right yesterday and wrong today. Well, that's what you're doing. What you were saying that when Bishop Barron turns you into and when he tries to deplatform you, I mean, he literally said, I'm not going to give him a platform. He tries to deplatform you who are, who is simply stating, stating what the church has always stated for until like five minutes ago. I think at least you should respect that fact that our, our forebears in the faith that you would at least give it a platform to explain why it's wrong. Even, I mean, you know what, you know, whatever you want to say. And so that's why it is. It's become these political uh, methods for silencing any dissent. And the funny thing is I say that when the dissent are the people who are simply saying what the church has always said. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, the the remark- when, when Barron writes the forward to Balthazar's book, he says the old position and he mentions Augustine and Aquinas. But he says that Balthazar brought about an originizing of Augustine. And I just want to full, throw up a red flag and say, Barron, you can't do that. Let's right. talk about this. And then he says, no, he, Marshall doesn't get a platform. Right. That doesn't make any sense. Because, and, and, and also because you have to admit that the idea of the anonymous Christian, the idea that, that turned into this uh, relativism, religious relativism. And I know that Bishop Barron explicitly states he doesn't believe in religious relativism. And I do think that von Balthasar's von Balthar's position was uh, not as straightforward as some people think it is, that he mm-hmm. just thought every single person going to heaven, yep. heaven. he did not There's think nuance, that. Of course. There's nuance to it. That's the purpose of the discussion and debate, right. is for Bishop Barron to bring out that nuance and you to say, but wait a second, that nuance, though, what you're saying, that actually contradicts what St. X and St. Y and, and, and Jesus and all of them said. And show me why it doesn't contradict. And then you have this discussion. And then people come away from it and say, okay, that uh, that makes sense. And I think Taylor's got, I would think they would say, I think Taylor's got the, 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 the tradition of the church behind him, an authoritative teaching church behind him. And these new novel ideas of a von Balthasar, which he might have had good intentions and whatever, all that stuff is irrelevant. You know, that, that stuff really needs to be uh, kind of put in the wastebasket of of theological discourse eventually right. uh, but it needs to be discussed and like you said just like you give arius why, why would the catholic church give arius who was the the first true extremist <laughs> yeah. why would they Heresy give art. him a yeah give him a platform but bishop Barron thinks giving somebody like you or somebody like me a platform is is just beyond the pale uh, yeah. Yeah. it's it is the political politicization of theological dis, uh, discourse Right. I mean, if you go back to a great time of, you know, the 13th century, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, disputatio, disputation, was the name of the game. I mean, even when you read the Summa Theologiae, Thomas always puts the arguments up front of his opponent, the right. best ones. There's no straw men in the Summa Theologiae. He puts the best arguments up, then he does a said contra, then he does his response, and then he... he refutes each one of those arguments against his position, which is the Catholic position. That's responsible. I mean, that is the way that Catholics, I mean, even in the very opening articles of the Summa Theologia, he talks about his argumentation part of the, the sacred doctrine theology. He said, yes, yes. I mean, the, the, the first rule of a good debater 
is that you understand your opponent's position as well as or even better than they do. Correct. And so when Dawn, for example, said, I don't really accept Vatican II as valid because I criticized Mm -hmm. it, she clearly isn't even trying to understand my point of view. Correct. She's not trying to understand where I'm coming from. She's not being like St. Thomas Aquinas and saying, okay, let's see what he says. Let's understand it. And I might need to ask him to clarify it, but I'm going to be open to his point. I'm going to be open to hear what he has to say first. Then I'm going to say, here's why he is. Why am I wrong? Why is criticizing Vatican II mean it's, it's invalid? There's no, and you can't do that on Twitter, which is why I wanted to take it outside of Twitter mm-hmm. into an actual debate. Mm-hmm. But it's easier just to, you know, just politicize it and, 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 and stereotype it and even falsely say false things about it. But what I think is hilarious is in how, they, how they're politicizing the debate is that's exactly what they've accused us of doing for years now, that we bring politics into religion. I that know, if you supported Trump, that show, you know, you're just putting him as God over, or, over the Pope right. or whatever, that you're putting American politics. If you're a, a capitalist, then, then you put politics over religion, stuff like that. But yet, at the same time, they're using all the political tactics of the left in their, practically, in, in what they're doing. And so it's like, who's bringing politics in? I want to have a theological discussion here. I don't give a flying rip about Trump. I want to have a discussion about matters that impact the Catholic Church. Right. And that's what matters. But no, then you just throw it out there, the, you know, you politicize. And, and the other thing is the stereotype, like the idea that every traditional Catholic is lockstep on every single prudential matter under the earth. <laughs> if only they knew. <laughs> exactly. And I will be the first to say that I do not, there's a number of prudential things that I would, I'm, I'm sure I'm out of the mainstream of traditional Catholics, prudential decisions. Obviously, we're not talking about faith and morals, things like that. But I've never felt like I'm now unworthy of being a, a, or a church of Catholics would think I'm like the worst guy in the world just because I, I just got a few prudential issues. Actually, I feel like we can debate those things. Yet what will happen is they will immediately throw that into your face. Like you think all these things, like you think women shouldn't ever wear pants. They'll throw that out as the first thing I'm like, yeah, you have no idea. First of all, what I think well, about it, it, it's, it's Saul Linsky. pick a target, right. freeze it, personalize it, polarize it. That's what they do. And, and what's amazing is, Eric, is we live in a time period where the ability to have discourse and disputation is e- it's the easiest it's ever been. I mean, Arius <laughs> and everyone had to pack up their stuff and go to Nicaea or go to Constantinople, right? Even even at Vatican I and Vatican II, bishops had to pack and come on ships from all over the world, Right. Now you can turn on Skype right, and just talk and go through the the points. Yeah, because when I was— It's so easy. It's so easy. When we offer to debate somebody like a Bishop Barron or somebody like that— Yeah, we're not saying take two weeks off and travel here. Literally, it's five minutes to set up, and then you you talk for an hour or two, and then you're done. Yeah. And that's it. And and so you're right. It is. It's it's amazing how that has happened— but I do, I, I think it comes back to the fact that over the past 10 years, that there has been a real effort to use these leftist tactics to silence voices. Mm-hmm. But I do think this, and this is where I, it's very easy to hear all this and get upset and depressed and all that. I think though what it does is it backfires. Yeah. I think what happens is by doing that, and we actually saw that in the political realm Mm. I personally think, and I don't want to get into politics here, but I personally think one of the big reasons Trump won is because they had they had tried to deplatform conservatives so, for so long that conservative finally said, screw it, we're just gonna pick this guy because he doesn't care if you try to deplatform. He can't be because, you know, whatever reasons. Right. Well, I think I not that I'm saying we should create Catholic Trumps in the church or anything like that, but I am saying <laughs> that we, but what we what what's happening though is I have met over and over. I had emails sent to me. I have met people in person over the, especially in the last, since McCarrick, I think, but especially in the last couple of years mm-hmm. where people come up to me and say, I was just kind of going along and I thought, you know, I would, li- I'd hear what you would say and other people. And all of a sudden 
people were calling you and other people these terrible names and saying, and I thought, what the heck? And it made them want to step up. Mm. Yeah. And it made them, and it, honestly, I will say that to, about me as well, because I wanted to, in my mind, I think I believe I had deplatformed uh, certain traditional outlets, certain traditional people in my mind, subconsciously or consciously, whatever. But then I finally came to the realization, and, and McCarrick, I think, was like the final straw. Right. Where I said, wait a minute, they're right all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why, why am I not giving them a, a, a platform? They're actually the only ones who have been right. And so when that happened, I, and I don't think, I, I I'm, I'm firmly believe I'm definitely not even near the only person that's happened to. Lots of people who were just your kind of mainline Orthodox Catholics, conservative Catholics, whatever you want to call them, they kind of saw the, the demonization of people like Cardinal Burke. I mean, there's a perfect example yes. there. Yeah, Cardinal let's talk Burke, about that. Who, everybody, who's, anybody who's ever met him. Talk about I have pick not, a target, freeze it, polarize it. I mean, I, I'm, I do not know personally Cardinal Burke, but I have a friend who worked for him and knows him very well. And this friend I trust very well. And he said, the man is just simply a holy, humble man who wants to do what's best for souls. He has no mm. personal agenda. And there's stories of him that this guy, and I don't, I don't want to tell because I don't feel like I have the, uh, uh, I, I should do that. But there's stories he, I've heard of him behind the scenes, the way he has reached out in charity to people and the way he has treated people you know, behind the scenes in charity and humbleness, people that are that his ideological enemies. And yet what has happened? He has been turned into this representation of an anti-pope, of the leader of a schism, of an extremist, all these things. And I think what's happened is lots of people like me, like you, who know Cardinal Burke is just this, this holy man. who the I'm nicest, not saying he's perfect, but he's humble, like this whole yeah, guy you ever met trying to do what's best. In fact, some of us would even say that he should do more. So it's not even like he is truly anywhere near the extreme as people make him out to be. Mm -hmm. And I think the average Catholic sees that and says, wait a second, that's crazy. I mean, just last week, Catholic Answers had a great tweet where they came out and said, we consider Cardinal Burke yes. a friend, and we consider that we know that when he, that anything he does, he's doing for the good of souls. They weren't even saying we agree with every single thing he does, because mm -hmm. they don't have to. They were simply saying, we treat him as a brother in Christ, and we respect him and his voice as a legitimate one that needs to be heard. Yes. Well, for doing that, I saw people cons now all of a sudden throw Catholic answers <laughs> under the bus, like they did with EWTN, yep. like they did with you, you know, and with yep. me, and all that stuff. They, they is now all of a sudden you're part of the schism, and the idea that Catholic answers, which I, you know, my last book was published by them. I love Catholic answers. I would, I disagree with some of the things they do. Of course, I do. That's yeah, the Catholic whole point. answers that's isn't exactly that. the remnant. No, exactly. <laughs> but that's exactly what they've done is they've made right. it so that they treat Catholic answers like they're in it. And so what happens is right. the average Catholic who loves Catholic answers and thinks they do great stuff because they do, mm -hmm. they, they look at them and say, wait a second, if you're saying the Catholic answers like the remnant, maybe I need to look at the remnant. Instead of saying I shouldn't look <laughs> right. at Catholic yeah. answers, they think I should look at the remnant because that's what's right. happening is a lot of Catholics, are, that's what they're doing. They're not saying, okay, now we distance ourselves from Catholic answers, they're saying, maybe I need to look at the remnant for a second time. Right. And I think that's, that's how it backfires. And that's that in, in, again, the political uh, description is that's kind of what happened with a lot of Republicans with, and conservatives, I should say with Trump is you're saying that, you know, all these people are terrible. Well, maybe, you know, that Romney's just like Trump or whatever. Maybe I should look at Trump because I know Romney ain't that bad. You know, I know today right. Romney hates Trump and all that, but right. like I said, this isn't politics, but so I think that's what's happening. I think so. That's the good news I have. I feel like the thing that gives me hope is the more you demonize mainstream people and mainstream organizations, the more you make yourself outside the mainstream, yeah. and the more you make yourself really the extremist. And and more and more Catholics will see that and say, okay, we need to listen to pe people. We need to listen to people like the remnant. Uh, you know, we need to listen to. Uh, you know, the Wander or whatever the, the, the organization are. We need to listen to Taylor Marshall and say that maybe so. And we need to listen to Cardinal Burke, mm. Bishop Athanasius Schneider, that they're not leaders of a schism, but they're simply trying to return us to what the church has always believed. Yeah. You know, and the, we should kind of maybe turn the page here to hope. Maybe, you know, there's also a lot of, as, as 
people are being demonized. There's also this sort of this new renaissance of what people are calling unite the clans. You know, this this brave heart motif. And it's true that even, you know, on you know, in certain circles for the past 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, there have have been hostilities, but I think the more and more you see them attack a Burke or an Athanasius Schneider, a Brand Moore, a Cardinal Sarah, they attack a I, Cardinal Sarah. Yeah. Right? You you start seeing these attacks. And then when these good men are being attacked, and you see silence from United States bishops. Right. No one's saying, hey, leave Cardinal Burke's one of our cardinals. Leave him alone. Don't right. Say, they don't say anything. Or very few say. There are some who who are do support Burke, but very few. That begins this sort of internal search. Well, maybe we need to get together because we're about to get rounded up. You know, they're right. about to say we're just a bunch of schismatic racists that are outside the church. And so maybe, you know, those guys over there at the Wanderer who actually been saying a lot of stuff that turned out to be true, maybe they're legit, you know, maybe I need to give a second chance to name anyone life site news church militant any right. of these any of these groups that some people say well they're a little radical or i don't like the tone yeah and i tell you, you know? what i uh, another red pill moment for me was when you had that interview with michael matt uh the unite the clans one i mean yes. i'd already come over at that point but it solidified it i should say mm -hmm. because i had not really paid attention to the remnant because i had again subconsciously looked at them as just the extreme Mm. And I just assumed Michael Matt was just some flame throwing crazy because I hadn't looked into him. Mm. I had I was doing exactly what I'm saying we shouldn't do, and I'll be the first to admit it. Then I listened to him like, wait a second, this guy's just a faithful Catholic trying to bring us closer, you know, bring the church together in following Christ, like we've done for two thousand years. That's all he is. Yeah. He's not some crazy flamethrower. Yeah, he'll say some things that I don't agree with, but in general, I, I, his intentions are obviously good. But more than his intentions. What he's picking out as the problem is right on target, much more than you'll see from your average bishop or uh, you know mainstream priest or something like that. They will talk about things being the problem that aren't the problem. They'll, they'll, they'll say, hey, we just need to do this now in, in, in our parishes. We need to do this program. It's why like Michael Matt and others are saying, no, you're not seeing the fundamental problem. Yeah, it's not at a program. Right, exactly. It's not. And it, it's, it's much more foundational than that. And so it is nice to see. I mean, I was very uh, talking about hope. I was very encouraged. Um, I can't. Oh, I'm losing his name. The Bishop of Tyler, Texas. Strickland, Bishop Strickland. Thank you, Bishop Strickland. He has been kicking some tail on Twitter at least lately. Everybody, go follow Bishop yeah. Strickland on Twitter. And I am the first. I have been very critical of bishops, and I, especially U.S. bishops, especially mm -hmm. U.S.C.C. Bill that. And I feel like they're they're just a major part of the problem. But you got to give kudos. When a bishop stands up and says, "Hey, this is this is uh, this is not right," and he and he defends people like a Cardinal Burke, and he calls for prayer and fasting. He calls for he does. He just today, I think, or yesterday, he, he had a pastoral letter where he uh, talked about we need to pray that false doctrine doesn't enter into the church through the Amazon Synod, and very strong language for a bit for a bishop. I mean, it might not be how we'd say it, but it was very strong language. I mean, yes. very it was very it, good. It wasn't the kind of normal, just even from the good bishops that says nothing. And so that, that's the reason for hope. And I wonder, and I don't know Bishop Strickland at all, and I just wonder if he sees the same thing we see and say, wait a second, what's going on? You can't like all of a sudden turn Cardinal Burke into this uh, person we need to deplatform and, and turn into an unperson. Yeah. And so that gives him courage. And I'm hoping that happens because I've seen it in the laity. And so I'm hoping is we see it more and more in the the, the hierarchy as well. And you see it more with the, the, uh, priests too. I'm seeing it with priests. A lot of priests with, coming out on EWTN yep. this past week. Right. Or last that, week. that was great. That's great. Yeah. The, the, that priest who uh, uh, preached that homily, which by any normal common sense Catholic way was not some crazy no, homily. He was calling for prayer, fasting. He was saying we need to resist possible uh, errors. Sure. and. And there's nothing uncatholic about saying this. This was hilarious. Saying there's something 
heretical in a working document. There's no magisterial authority of a working document. It's a rough draft. No, it's the whole point of it is, and the reason, in theory at least, why they release it early is so you can have debate to make sure there are no heresies when it finally gets uh, discussed and approved at the Senate. Yeah. And so the idea that saying that there's heresies in a working document, you might be wrong, but you're not being like anti-Catholic to say that. Yeah. You're just simply stating that I think this goes against Catholic teaching, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah. but that was great to see, and I, I I've seen other priests, and so it's hard. And I always think lay people, we do need to be very understanding of our priests and our bishops mm-hmm. in how hard it is. It is harder for a priest than it is for somebody like you or me to uh, to do something to to speak out. Uh, a priest, they, their first focus is the the souls under their care. And so everything is in that lens. A good, I'm talking about the good priest. You know, everything is through that lens. And so everything they do, they think that first. And the logic is, and I get the logic, is if I speak out and say something against this bishop or the pope or something like that, then my bishop is going to come down hard on me. I'm going to be kicked out of this parish and I'm going to be sent to, you know, the the diocesan Siberia. St. Luke's. Right. And how, and yeah. yeah, or even more extreme, which has happened, uh, something like a St. Luke's. Yeah. And, and the thinking is, how does that help the souls under me that are, I'm responsible for? I get that. And I, I would always encourage priests, first of all, we're praying for you, and I understand how hard it is. But we do need, there will be, that's a martyrdom. And there is a time for martyrdom. And it's a, it's a, it's not obviously the, the the red martyrdom, but it is a white type martyrdom when you're sent to St. Luke's, or you're sent to the diocese in Siberia. That is possible that God is calling a priest to do that because he needs the lay people need to hear it from him, mm-hmm. and they need to be awakened from their slumber. Um, but it's easy for me sitting here to say that I know that right. you know I always I always hesitate to ever say call anybody else to martyrdom because. <laughs> uh, and only by God's grace would I react the right exactly. way. Exactly. And it, it, I know under my power exactly how I would react. I'd run and hide. So, you know, we need to keep praying for our priests. And then that's, that's what we're calling for, actually, prayer and fasting. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, for prayer our priests, for our bishops, for our cardinals, for the pope, uh, for the synod, and things like that. So l- let me, maybe, this could be maybe our final question. That is, if things don't change, could it get worse? I mean, could we have... Could it be the case that good old Burke says, or they say to Burke, you're in schism or you lost your red hat? You know, I, I think it's definitely possible. Or Bishop I think- Strickland, you're, we, you're out. You're no longer Bishop of Tyler. I could see that definitely happen. I definitely could see Bishop Strickland getting moved somewhere that is uh, uninfluential or something like that. Because that's, ha- that's what happened to Burke. I and mean, that's exactly what happened to Burke. But you know, it backfired because Burke was removed from a a real post. And so now all he does is speak and travel. Right. He has freedom now. It's it's a blessing in a way. I personally think it's unlikely that they will actually drop the hammer of kicking people out like us, like a Cardinal Burke. Because why? Because that's not the method you use. The method is to basically make them an unperson through various channels so that they lose all influence. Mm-hmm. And if they, they don't want to create martyrs, if they, let's say tomorrow Pope right. Francis announced that he was excommunicating Cardinal Burke, he becomes the immediate martyr. First yeah. of all, I know I, I'm confident that the way Cardinal Burke would respond would be to pray and fast and he wouldn't like, you know, yes. create some, some sister would church. would be like Martin Luther and, and burn the no. decree in the town square. Absolutely not. <laughs> And so that would, but that would be, that would be revealing the hand. Like I mentioned earlier, the passive aggressive nature. If you play your cards too uh, explicitly, then what happens is you're revealed, your your true agenda is revealed for what it is. Mm -hmm. People can still defend the agenda of Pope Francis and others as being just, I'm just trying to lead the Catholic Church and doing the right Catholic thing. If you all of a sudden start kicking people out who are obviously faithful Catholics, now, all of a sudden, your agenda is much more obvious and much more revealed. And I think that's, you don't want to do that. You'd rather do these backdoor ways. So, wise, I think it is possible. I 
I, at least under this pope, I don't think it's happening. It's just like how Pope Francis, he just didn't answer the dubia. He didn't say right. anything explicitly against them. He just didn't answer them. He says these little backwards things, you know, the, the kind of back channel things where he, he says these little comments that kind of point towards them, but he doesn't go out. Now, it's possible we get a Francis too, that a Kupich type or something like that, that doesn't care, that maybe isn't as smart or doesn't, you know, has a different way of looking at things where it could happen. So, yes, I think under this pope, I would say no, but under a future pope, it is possible. And that's what, but I also, I, I know I might be considered a naive or idealist, but I really do think things like all of a sudden God intervening in a extraordinary way at the next conclave is possible. That you either, think so? you think I we do. I, I, I don't think that, that a Cardinal Boise, Burke could get elected. Yes. Or that a Cardinal Kupich gets elected and converts something like that. Mm, because okay. I do believe that we've seen that right. in history. We believe in miracles. Yeah, we do believe in miracles. And if we like don't, the pious the ninth. Yeah. I mean, if we, yeah, right. It, it, it has happened and it can happen. And that's the reason we're fasting and praying because mm -hmm. I know, you know, it's, I don't want to get too knee deep in the theology here, but God does act in certain circumstances based upon how we have acted, whether or not we have prayed and fast. That's why we do it. We wouldn't do it otherwise. And so the direction of history can be changed by our sacrifices, by our prayers, by our speaking out, all those things. And so I still do hold out hope that something like, I still hold out hope that would happen to Pope Francis, uh, that he would change the direction. But I think it is possible that a Cardinal Burke could walk out. Now, if it does, of course, we have to make sure we don't turn into papologers, that we say, you know, the only reason we support what the Pope Burke is saying is because he's just simply saying what popes for 2,000 years have said. But I do think that is, that is a plausible. And I think, honestly, it will eventually happen because the church always comes back from its darkest days. It might be five years. It might be in 100 years. Yeah. But it will happen. We I've will praying, get you know, the, the Pope of... 2050 we may live to see it eric but yeah, the, pope, so. the pope of 2050 is walking around earth right now right he's young man maybe he's 19 or 20 i don't know what his age is he's probably discerning his vocation he might be in seminary but my guess is is the pope of 2050 will be a traditional catholic i, I think that's a I very good i good don't think there's going to be many liberals left Maybe I'm wrong. I wouldn't have thought it would have happened in 2019, but you know, I I do think that the we are seeing younger priests trend more traditional. Right. That being said, I've been around a lot of seminarians and taught seminarians, and I've been surprised by how liberal some of them are. Right, and we can't act the like last it's five just years. I'm like, all Whoa, good. Yeah, these guys are really liberal. That being right. said, I think in general it does trend more traditional. Air is not procreative. It doesn't. Yeah, it's sterile. And so it's very, it's sterile. It cannot regenerate itself except for through trying to bring, you know, trying to get people. But the, the airs, it's a kind of communism. What happened with communism? It fell mm -hmm. apart in Soviet Union because it can't continue it, its yeah, existence. Inertia. And so the same thing I think is true here. And so I think it's very plausible. We may not see it. Hopefully, at least our kids will see it the day. Yes. Now, that might be a situation. Yes, it might be a situation where. The number of Catholics on Earth is incredibly smaller than it is today. But I if it's it will be. If, if, but if it's faithful, right? It's less a miracle. But if it's more faithful, that I think pleases God. Obviously, we want all men to come to the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ and come to salvation, just like God will wants that, as, as the Bible says. But if it was true that we had a much smaller church, but it was much more faithful in its worship and how it worshipped in in how it, it preached the gospel. I look at that as simply a pullback in order to move forward. That yeah. you 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 strengthen your base so that you then can go out. Because if if let's say in 50 years the mm -hmm. church is a lot smaller but more faithful, then I would say in 150 years the church is, is going to be a lot bigger then. Because it has that base in which it can now evangelize the world. Just like the Lord had 12 men mm -hmm. and he was able to you, but it was a strong base, and so then you know it had one person who wasn't so strong. But you know at the at, at Pentecost, you had this strong base, and then it explodes over three hundred years. I think that can happen again. It's kind of like my wife. My wife Joy always uses the rubber band analogy. You take a rubber band; the further you stretch it, the further it's going to fly. Right. 
And I think that that crucible, you know, that that stretching, the suffering that happens with the church, ultimately, hopefully, will propel it forward into a, a great age of Catholicism if our Lord doesn't return, right before then. And that's but, up uh, <laughs> you know, we always we work and operate as if the Lord. We pray for His return, but we work and operate as if we have to keep going because we don't know Absolutely. the ends ends near. Absolutely. So I'm always hopeful. You know, I'm absolutely. I think one great thing about being a traditional Catholic is that you're very much well aware of the ascetic tradition and you're taught that by your priests. You, you know, I've been in confession and you know, the priest says, well, are you praying for your wife and your family? Are you fasting one day a week for your wife? Your family? I'm like, Oh, am I supposed to be doing that? Well, you're not required under pain of sin, but yeah, if you want to, you know, really help your family, it's not just about teaching and paying the mortgage and all those things, you know, and putting kids to bed. In our time, maybe you have to pray and fast for your family as well. Maybe we have to pray and fast the Ember Days, which we just had this past week. That's right. For our priests and our bishops. Right. Our pastor, he talks over and over again about the importance of sacrifice, of mm -hmm. prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, we pray and fast for ourselves, for our family for good and holy priests, for good and holy bishops, for the Pope. We also pray for those, we pray and fast for those who've done the damage, the McCarricks of the world. Yeah. We pray for them as well. And he, he emphasizes over and over because that's what Jesus does. Mm. Jesus died on the cross, not just for uh, right. uh, St. John, John the Evangelist, but also for the people who are putting the nails in. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have the same attitude. And so, but you're right, being a traditional Catholic, what that does is it does remind you of that, that it's not about let's go do something for the environment tomorrow, but let's let's pray and fast over and over again. And if we if we do that, it really will have a result. That's the thing. I know it's hard. This is the hardest thing to believe is that because we'll, we haven't seen the results very much, but it will have the intended, the intended result. When I say the intended result, God's intended result, it might not turn out the way in the, the way we hope it does and the way we think it will but it will turn out for the good and the glory of God. Yeah. Amen. Well, very good. Well, we should, um, speaking of, we should close in our prayer. And okay. uh, I'd like to encourage uh, everyone to check out Eric on Twitter. We have something in common. We both have our middle initial R, which confuses people. Mine's Taylor R. Marshall at on Twitter. And yours is Eric R. Simmons. That's I guess we couldn't get Sam. ours without the middle initial yeah, I can't remember when I hooked it up. I think I, there, it wasn't there or something. But yeah, somebody else, yeah. another Eric Sammons had taken it. So yeah, yeah Eric so that, R. Sammons. Yeah, so we both have the R middle initial. So follow us on Twitter. And then you can get Eric's book, The Old Evangelization, How to Spread the Faith Like Jesus Did. Uh, a good book there. And uh, anything else you want to mention or share? No, that sounds great. Okay, good. And then we always remind everyone, of course, to pray the rosary. You can't... You can't talk about these things if you're not picking up the spiritual weapons, if you're not praying the rosary every single day, 365 days a year, pray the rosary. If it's 1149 PM, get the beads out. Don't go to sleep. Pray the rosary every night. And if you miss it, not pain of sin, just, you know, start up the next day. But we have to pray the rosary because Our Lady asked it in 1917, Our Lady of Fatima. As lay people, we can't say Mass, we can't do extreme unction, we can't hear confessions. We can pray the rosary, and that is meditating on the mysteries of Jesus Christ as we ask Our Lady to help us. That's all the rosary is, meditating on Jesus, asking her to help us. So pray the rosary every day, pray and fast, live your vocation, be a saint, become holy, and... Uh, that's all there is to it. So uh, again, please subscribe to the channel. If you like this video, hit the like button. When you subscribe, hit the little bell for notification. And the best thing you can do is share this video. So hit the share button and share it on Facebook or Twitter. We'd really appreciate it. And then I also appreciate if you want to support the channel, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. Taylor Marshall, and I'll send you some signed books and some other stuff if you check it out over there patreon.com forward slash Dr. Taylor Marshall. And now we'll pray. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, 
Benedicta tu in moriaribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or per nobis peccatoribus, nunc editor mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. St. Pio, pray, pray for, for us. us. All right, Eric, so, so great to be with you, talk with you, hang out. We'll do it again. Sounds great. Awesome to be here. All right. Signing off, everybody.